Okay, so um, let, let's begin. So today we'll talk about some applications of the Tom transversality theorem. Um, so we'll start the section Whitney. We'll start with the Whitney immersion. Professor, and embedding Oi? These challenges of technology. E agora? Agora dá para Okay. Um, sorry about that. Okay. So let's. I'm gonna. The first thing I'm gonna do is actually define a submanifold of the jet space of the one jet space. Um, or I will find several submanifolds so you can see how they come up naturally. So let's start with two manifolds, X and Y. And we'll begin with a little definition. So given a jet, a one jet. Uh, so that means some one jet of a function at that point X. Notice that the uh, linearization of the function at the point uh, from TPX to TPY is well defined. I mean, doesn't depend, doesn't depend on the choice of F. So it only depends on the jet, right? If I choose another function that has the, the same uh, first jet at X, then it's gonna have the same linearization. That's basically the definition of, uh, of jets. Uh, so that means we can define the rank of uh, sigma to be the rank of this um, linear transformation. Okay, so that's the dimension of the image. And I think you all remember from uh, your linear algebra that this is at most the minimum of M and N. Okay, so M, uh, my, here I always say that the dimension of, of the domain is N and the dimension of the target is M. Okay, so the rank is at most the minimum of M and N. And we're gonna define the co-rank to be basically the how far away you are from being maximum rank. So it's the min of M and N minus the rank of sigma. So every one jet has a co-rank. This, this definition of co-rank is not completely standard, but that's what we're going to use today. OK, so um, yeah, so lemma. F is an immersion or a submersion uh, if and only if the image of the, fir the first jet of F. Uh, oh, no, sorry, I forgot to define one thing. Okay, now with this definition, I can define um, a submanifold of the space of jets, which is just the set of um, jets such that the co-rank of sigma is equal to R. Okay, so it's not clear yet that this is a submanifold, but we'll see that this is a submanifold in a little bit. We will see that SR is a submanifold. But before that, let's see why this is relevant. So this is relevant because of the following lemma. F is an immersion in the case when 
uh, n is less than or equal to m, or a submersion in the case when n is bigger than or equal to m, if and only if the first jet of f, uh, the image of the first jet of f is transverse to the union, um, sorry, does not intersect the union of all this SRs for R bigger than or equal to one, so if this intersection is empty. Okay? Um, so maybe you can just stare at it and see uh, th that it, this is kind of obvious. But maybe, let me write down the proof, because uh, I think that the jet space still seems kind of daunting for, for I think, a lot of you. So let's, let's write this down. So um, let me say this again. F is an immersion or a submersion. So basically, the derivative of F at a point P has maximum rank, uh, if and only if the first jet of F, uh, the image of the first jet of F doesn't intersect the union of these submanifolds, the union of these sets. So let me write down the proof. So well, if F is not an immersion, or a submersion, depending on the dimension, if and only if there exists a point P such that the rank is not maximum, such that the rank of the derivative of F um, is less than, is uh, at most the minimum of M and N minus one. Okay, that's what it means uh, for for f not to be an immersion or submersion. If if the rank of the derivative of every at every point is a maximum rank, then uh, it's either an immersion or a submersion, depending on the dimension. Okay, so this happens if and only if there exists a p such that the co-rank of the first jet of f at p uh, is bigger than or equal to one. Okay, this is you know this is the, the rank of d f p is the same as the rank of the first jet of f at x. Okay, so um, that's the same thing as saying that the image of the first jet of x intersects s r for some oh. well let me write that down. for r equal to the co rank which is bigger than or equal to one okay which is if and only if the first jet of F, the image of the first jet of F intersects SR for some R greater than or equal to one. Okay, so that's the proof. Okay, any questions? This, is a, this, this should be a straightforward proof. So if you have a question here, please let me know. It could be to understand the, the basic definition of something. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, so SR are the elements of the jet that have one point which has co-rank R? What do you mean have one point? Because uh, the rank of the differential does not depend on the point. No, 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 the jet, ah, or the when you fix a jet, you know, when you fix a jet, you already ah, okay. fix a point. Yeah. Okay, okay. I know it's a little confusing, like a jet is different from a function. A jet is the jet of a function at a point. So you're already fixing ah, okay. the point. Yeah. It's okay, and so the P is the source of, of jet, the jet. Yeah. And the rank is not locally constant, you have to be careful with that. 
So if the rank is maximum, then you have some kind of inverse implicit function theorem to say that it's, that's a local property. That's an open condition. But if the rank is not maximum, that's not an open condition. Right? Okay. I got it. No, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah, so let me actually write down this observation. The observation is that S0 is open. So if you, so having a co-rank zero or being maximum rank is open. Uh, but SR in general is neither open nor closed. But the union of SR for R greater than or equal to one, and of course this is a finite union, this is the complement of S0 minus S0. This is closed. Okay? So now let's let's prove a proposition. Let's prove that these SRs are actually uh, submanifolds. So proposition SR is a submanifold of codimension n minus q plus r m minus q plus r where q is the min of n and n okay so sr is a submanifold maybe you know if this observation is not completely clear i think it will be uh through the course of this proof okay so proof um, so first of all, note that SR is a bundle, fiber bundle, over X times Y with fiber the fiber is just given by the set of matrices so linear maps from our n to our m whose co-rank is equal to r okay so i mean this is if, if you remember the definition of a fiber, fiber bundle this is pretty pretty simple uh, you know the you, we know that the one jet space is a fiber bundle over the product x times y with fiber just given by the the space where the derivatives live you know so this uh, this linear space of maps from r n to r n and the extra condition that we impose to be in s r is basically the same as saying that the co-rank of the derivative uh, is r so let me just, I guess I, I haven't quite defined the co-rank of a linear map, but the co-rank, um, let me, yeah, of A is just the minimum of M and N minus the rank of A. But this is not completely standard, like I said. Some people define the co-rank as just M minus the rank of A. But for, for now, we'll define it like this, because we want to talk about immersions and submersions at the same time. Okay. Any questions about this? So now it's enough to, yeah, go ahead. Maybe to be precise, uh, when we defined fiber bundle, we already assumed that, that the space above is a manifold. So. Ah, okay. Um, but I think you right. don't yeah. need to write. Yeah, so, yeah. so you, you're right. Uh, so we don't need to say that, but let, let me just say, uh, that it, there, there is a map from, yeah, 
So forget about being a manifold. Uh, there is a map from SR to this, uh, and the fiber is uh, bijack. There's a bijection of the fiber with this guy. So uh, to ba basically, what we need to to prove to prove that SR is a manifold and is a fiber bundle um, is that this uh, LR is a manifold. So the claim is that this LR of RN RM is a submanifold of the linear space of maps, of linear maps from Rn to Rn, of, of the right codimension, of codimension, this same codimension. Yeah, so uh, who, who made the comment? Sorry, I, I didn't see your name. Uh, my name is Pietro. Pietro, yeah. Pietro is right. You know, I'm kind of uh, being a little sloppy here, but yeah, when I defined fiber bundle, I, I suppose that the, that the top was a manifold already. So yeah, it's, but, but we don't need that. But once you prove this claim, then it will follow that the space is a, is a manifold. So th there is a map from, a, what, what I meant to say is that if you drop the condition of being a manifold, uh, there is a map from SR to X times Y, which is surjective. And then, uh, and the fibers are all given by this, our biject, our, um, there's a bijection of the fibers with this guy. Uh, and then we have the local triviality too. Um, so all you need to show now basically to conclude that this SR is a manifold and is a fiber bundle is that these fibers are submanifolds of uh, L of RN, RN. Okay? All right. Um, so now, now this is kind of like linear algebra. It's not completely linear algebra because it's not a, a vector subspace. If you take two manifolds uh, and you of uh, the same co-rank and you sum them, they are not necessarily going to have the same co-rank. Uh, so it's really a submanifold and not a, a vector subspace. Um, but let's prove the claim. Well, <clears throat> let let's fix a manifold. Uh, sorry, let's fix a matrix. Uh, or a linear transformation here of rank. Uh, let K be the rank, rank of M. So that's equal to Q minus R. Um, then we can find bases bases of Rm and R, Rn and Rm such that in that basis, we can write M as a matrix, uh, A, B, C, D, where A is a K by K invertible matrix. You can compute the other dimensions, but you know, uh, so th this, this is an M by N matrix and I'm just, uh, picking A to be K by K, by K invertible matrix, and then the other ones will have the dimension that you need. Okay. Um, so in a neighborhood, of M, and this is by the inverse function theorem or some, um, actually this, I think this is even simpler than that. We can assume, like you can pick uh, in the same basis. Um, we can write every matrix in a, in a sufficiently small neighborhood of M, like this, as A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime, where A prime is still uh, well, A prime is a k by k invertible matrix. It's still a k by k invertible matrix. Always oh, a k by k matrix. And it is still invertible. Yeah, you don't need the inverse function theorem here. It's just by, uh, because, yeah, we can, yeah. You, you can think about this a little bit, but it's a simple uh, analysis in Rn question. 
Okay, because being invertible is some uh, condition in the determinant. The ter determinant is different from zero. It's an open condition. OK, so we can call this neighborhood U. Let me call this neighborhood U. OK, so now um, what is the rank of this M? Yeah, so let's fix, let M prime now being U, then what's the rank of M prime? Well, the rank of M prime is the rank of this matrix, A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime. And now I'm going to play a trick, which is I'm going to multiply this matrix by an invertible matrix on the left. So I'm going to multiply this by an M by M matrix on the left. So this is, it's going to be the following thing, identity K by K, identity M minus K by M minus K. So this is going to be a matrix M by M. When you, when, you, when you multiply a matrix by an invertible matrix on the left or on the right, it doesn't change the rank. Um, and here I'm going to multiply by minus C prime, A prime inverse. So when you do this calculation, this is the same as the rank um, of A prime, B prime, zero. And then here I have D prime, minus C prime, A prime inverse, B prime. Okay. So uh, what, what am I doing? I'm just trying to see what is the condition on A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime, so that M prime still has rank K. So I'm trying to figure out what's the condition of having rank K. Okay, so uh, this has rank K, if and only if, what condition holds? So I know that A prime is invertible and A prime is K by K. So if I want this matrix here to have rank K, I need this because this is a, a lower a upper diagonal as, um, as a matrix written in this way. I mean, not really upper diagonal, but the, the condition that you need is that this part here is zero. Because if this matrix here uh, that I'm pointing out is not zero, then the rake's definitely going to be bigger than K. Okay, this is, again, simple linear algebra because uh, you have at least one more vector here generating the image. Okay, so this rank is equal to K if and only if D prime minus C prime, A prime inverse B prime is equal to zero. Okay, so now you can begin to see, you know, the how we're going to get to prove that the that the ma matrices with fixed rank form a submanifold. Okay, we have a we have a condition here, uh, and we can take the preimage of this condition. Okay, so um, yeah, so now we can let phi. be a map from U to now I'm going to look at a map that just sends a matrix uh, M prime to this uh, to this number here. So it's this is a linear transformation in N minus K R M minus K. Okay, so it takes uh, well, I'm going to write it like this. It takes a matrix A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime in the appropriate basis and takes it to D prime minus C prime, A prime inverse B prime. Okay, and remember that because I'm in U, uh, I can assume that A prime is invertible. So this expression makes sense. And note that phi is a submersion. Why? Can you see why? 
is something like a projection. Uh, oh no, yes, yes, I think it is something like a projection, right? Uh, kind of, yeah, yeah. If, if you fix A prime, B prime, and C prime, then it's a, a, a projection plus a constant. Yeah, it, it's a projection plus a constant, basically. Yeah. So it's because sort of if you fix phi of, if you look at phi of A prime, B prime, C prime, and dot, if you let just, just this guy vary, this is going to be the identity. Uh, minus some kind of some constant. Okay, so basically you can the, the, you can attain anything that you want. Um, yeah. The if you, if you differentiate with respect to this guy here, you you can attain you get the identity on that part. So it's it's a submersion. Okay. Um, yeah, so if, if you write this down, uh, you differentiate with respect to uh, these guys here, uh, the, 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 uh, yeah, the, the, this matrix here, then you get the identity. Okay. So uh, the preimage of zero is a submanifold, and this is just um, LR, it's what we wanted, intersected with this open set U. So this is a submanifold. Of codimension, the codimension is given by the dimension of the target equal to the dimension of the target, and which is L n uh, r n minus k and r n minus k. So this is n minus k times m minus k. Okay, so that's the number that we wanted. This is exactly m minus q plus r times n minus q plus r. There we go. OK. All right. So you see that uh, the observation that I made before, I'm going to make it again, is that this L0 of Rn, Rm, uh, and by the way, this is the end of the proof. So I proved that if I take a point on the set, there is a neighborhood of this point where being on this uh, set is the same as you know, being on a submanifold. So that means that the, the, this, this set is a submanifold. OK. So just notice that this L0 is actually open. Uh, so the set S0 in J1 of xy is open to. And the union of SR for R greater than or equal to one is closed. Okay. Any questions? Is it clear that if you take just one of the SRs that that's not closed? Can someone say a word about that to see if you understand? So for example, why is that S0 not closed? Are you there? 
you can also uh, always find a sequence that's uh, gonna decrease their rank or increase. You can always find a sequence, uh, yeah, whose limit has whose a, limit has a, yep. has a smaller rank. Yeah, provided that the rank uh, is not, you know, minimum. Yeah. So if the rank is not zero, then you can always do that. Yeah. So if you're in S zero, you can always find a sequence of uh, matrices of highest rank that converge to a matrix of smaller rank. Yeah. Or even to the zero matrix. You can just take one over n times your matrix. And that's going to converge to the zero matrix. And that's a very simple example. OK, so is it clear that uh, so someone asked at the beginning of the class, so what, how, what, are, what are some natural submanifolds of jet spaces? And here are some. Um, so now we're going to talk more about immersion, and we're going to leave submersions for another time. Uh, so suppose lemma, suppose n is less than or equal to m, then this set of immersions, uh, sorry, immersions, I'm gonna write like this, m is this set of immersions is open in C infinity of x, y. Okay. And the proof is very simple. Uh, the proof is, well, the, the set of immersions where I, I show, you know, I told you that um, you are an immersion if and only if uh, you don't intersect this guy. So the set of immersions is simply uh, the set of functions m of s zero. So it, you know this is the set of uh, functions whose one jet, whose image such that the image of the first jet is contained in s zero. So this is open. This is open in the C one topology, and therefore it's open in the C infinity topology. This is a, an element of the base of the C1 topology. I mean, you can say the same thing for submersions, but then you have to write. It, it has to be the, the, the condition on the dimension is different. But now Hello, we're going to Yeah. Yeah, would, would you go to the previous page, please? Yes, yeah. uh, how, did you show, uh, how did you show that? Uh, that will be a submersion. You you said it is a projection, right? Uh, it's not a projection. It's a um, yes. It's a combination it, of it. It's a combination of a projection with a more complicated map. But what I said is, if you fix a prime, b prime, and c prime, then you have a you have a function from uh, the space of n by k uh, by m by k matrices to itself. Okay, and this map is the identity plus a constant. Yes. Okay. So okay. I mean, if, yeah, if you can see this. Um, yeah. Is, is that clear now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you can write the whole thing down. I just uh, got a little lazy, and I think you know this. This should you should be able to write this down. If you can't complete this, then you can ask me. OK, um, so we just realized this set of immersions is an open set. And now we can prove the Whitney immersion theorem. So this theorem is the Whitney immersion theorem, which we, can, we proved. Uh, we already proved this for uh, compact manifolds, uh, supposing just using Sartre's theorem. 
but now we actually can prove it in a much more general case. So we, if we have x and y manifolds such that the dimension of x is at least the dimension of uh, m is at least twice the dimension of x, then uh, the set of immersions from x to y is an open and dense subset of C infinity of x, y. OK? So I mean, the fact it's open, it's very, very easy. But it's going to be not only non-empty, but it's going to be dense. So um, yeah, I guess even the fact that it's non-empty is interesting. So if you put y to be uh, r to n, where x is a manifold, that will mean that in particular, there exists an immersion from x to r to n. So we showed this in the specific case when, I mean, when y was 2n, um, when y was r to the 2n, and x was compact. And we only used Thard's theorem. So basically what this, is, this theorem you should see is that actually if you work a little bit harder than Thard's theorem and, and do all this theory of transversality of jets uh, and think, you know, basically think a little bit harder, then you can prove with the immersion theorem uh, for non-compact manifolds. And if you, for some reason, really, really don't like jets, you can work hard to eliminate jets from the proof of the, uh, of the trans of Tom transversality theorem and write things in very complicated ways, but with no jets. And basically, you'll see that what we did before, you could kind of adapt to the case when x is compact, um, uh, when x is not compact, using some kind of similar argument um, I don't know, like with that, with that, that we that we use in the proof of uh, the Tom transversality theorem, where you fix like little compact sets and you take like countable union of them, and but I mean once we already proved that theorem, we were, like I said, you know, the baby's already born, so now we can we can be happy uh, and put the baby to work. Okay, so um, how do we prove this? At this point, it's actually quite simple. So the minimum of m and n, notice that's going to be n because of this assumption. Um, so for r greater than or equal to 1, uh, the co-dimension of SR is r, so it, this is n minus n plus r times m minus n plus r. So this is just going to be r times uh, m minus n plus r. And this is greater than or equal to r times n plus r, which is greater than or equal to n plus 1. Okay, this condition is because m is greater than or equal to 2n. So we have this. Um, this is because m minus n is greater than or equal to n. OK, so uh, the co-dimension of SR is bigger than or equal to m plus 1. So the first jet of f is transverse to SR if and only if they don't intersect. Okay, because the co-dimension of SR is greater than n plus 1, and the dimension of this guy uh, is less than or equal to n. Okay? Um, I mean, it's, it's equal to n, actually. Yeah, I mean, to be more precise, I think, yeah, like this guy is not necessarily, 
a manifold. So you know, basically this domain, we should say the domain has dimension n. Yeah. So this was like a, a very simple fact that you cannot achieve transversality uh, if the dimension of the domain uh, is less than the co-dimension of the manif the submanifold uh, of on on the um, of the target unless they don't intersect. Okay, so that's the that's what we get from this condition. Therefore. Uh, so um, this set of functions such that j1 of f, well, we know that this, uh, well, let me, let me just, now we take the union, no, let me, so by the Tom transversality theorem, This set of functions such that j1 of f is transverse to this guy is residual and hence dense. Um, so the set of immersions from x to y, this is the, the set of f's such that j1 of f of x doesn't intersect our, um, this is the intersection for r greater than one of this set. So it's an intersection, of, it's a finite intersection of then sets. So this is the same as the intersection from r greater than or equal to one to n, or equal one to n. of the set of functions such that J1 F is transverse to SR. And each of these is dense. So the, the intersection is dense. Um, sorry, no, no, that's not true. I have to use that they're residual. Being dense is not enough. So each of these is residual. Uh, so if you just intersect dense sets, you might not get anything. But if you intersect the residual sets, that's the thing. Like if you have a countable intersection of residual sets, in this case, it's a, it's a finite intersection of residual sets, then it'll still be residual because a residual set is an intersection, a countable intersection of open and dense sets. So this set of immersions is still going to be a countable intersection of open and dense sets. And by the bare property, that means that the whole thing is also residual. Uh, so the set of immersions, let me write this well. Set of immersions is residual. And now by the bare property, the set of immersions is dense. Okay, there we go. And we already saw it was open. That was here, the lemma. So we don't actually need such a strong condition for the set of immersions to be, to be open. But for it to be dense, you do. And that's it. Any questions? No. Are you there? Is this the hard with a mesh of No, not yet. No. Not yet. Okay. 
This is the middle. <laughs> middle. Okay. So, so the easy immersion theorem is just that there exists an immersion from x into r to n when x is compact. So, you know, remember the proof of that is uh, Im Im embedding of a uh, space into a large Euclidean space is very easy when the space is compact. All you do is you kind of you take a finite number of charts and then you embed each chart in a, each chart is basically gives you an embedding and you use bump functions to uh, glue these things together and to get an embedding into a very large Rn. And then you use Sartre's theorem to project it all the way down to some R something. And you, you know, when you look at Sartre's theorem, the numerology works out that you can always decrease the dimension R to the 2n and still have an immersion. Um, but if F x is no longer compact, then this argument, the, the first part doesn't work anymore. Um, it, it will work, I think, if uh, you already have an embedding. But if you don't have an embedding to begin with, then uh, you need slightly fancier techniques to be able to say, well, if you have a countable number of charts, you still get an embedding. And you know, you could probably do that just looking at the proof of Tom, Tom transversality theorem and the Bayer property of for C infinity functions and like getting rid of all the general topology. But I think it's just cleaner to do it this way using jets. And I think it's, it's more beautiful. Yeah, so this is kind of the middle a theorem and the hard theorem, the hard Tom, uh, the hard Whitney immersion and embedding theorem is that there exists an embedding of R of X into Rn, R to N, and there exists an immersion of X into R to N minus one. So the hard uh, Whitney immersion theorem is that if you look at the set of immersions, from x to r to n minus 1, that this is not empty. OK, so uh, now let's prove the, uh, the Whitney. Well, let's, let's go towards the Whitney embedding theorem. So now let's prove the Whitney one-to-one -one immersion theorem. So one to one is the same as injective. Um, so again, let X and Y be manifolds such that the dimension of Y is at least two N plus one. Then the set of injective immersions um, is residual in C infinity of x, y. OK, so proof. Well, the set of in injective immersions is the intersection of the set of immersions with the, the set of injections. So. Uh, we already know that the set of immersions in the situation is residual. We proved it here. So we need to show, we will show that the set of injections, so this is a set is residual. And now we're going to apply the uh, trans transitality theorem for multi-jets. Um, so recall that the zero jets, the zero multi-jets of order two. So what is this? This is just uh, x2 times y2. But basically, uh, so it's the set of points. I can write it like this. The set of points x1, x2, um, y1, y2, such that x1 is different from x2. Well, let, let me be a little clear. In x2 times y2, such that x1 is different from x2. And now you really see why this multi-jet uh, 
language makes something simpler. OK? Now we can consider um, a submanifold, which is x2 times the diagonal of y. So this is a set you know, of points x1, x2, y, y that x1 is different from x2. And then it's, it's easy to see, this is what I was trying to explain at the beginning of the class, that a function is injective if and only if uh, its zeroth jet of order 2 uh, does not intersect w. OK, so its zeroth jet of order two will just be, you know, take x1 and then you take the image of x1 and the image of x2. Uh, so being injective means that there won't be points x1, x2 uh, that uh, that go to the same image. Is, is this condition clear? I think this should be clear for everyone. Otherwise, I can explain it again. Okay. Okay, someone, I hear a noise. Robado. Yuri? Oi? Oi. O que, que você falou? Não, é só que é, 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 um, é um truque muito roubado. Ah, um truque muito roubado. <laughs> Tudo bem. Okay, so now you see how this uh, transversality theorem, it seems like maybe we're using something too big to kill uh, a mosquito, but um, I think it's still a very nice application in, um, of the theorem. So, you know, you have this, uh, this J2, uh, yeah, here this, this jet uh, of F is a function that goes from X2. Yeah, so, so, sorry, it's, it's the, the image of the whole X2. To the zero jet of order two, and then now notice that what is the codimension of W? The codimension of W is the same as the dimension of Y, because it's the codimension. Basically, on this part here, you have everything, and then on this part, you have the diagonal of Y inside of Y squared. So the codimension of W is the same as the dimension of Y, which is uh, greater than or equal to 2n plus 1. And that's greater than 2n, and 2n is the dimension of this guy, of the, of the domain here. Because this is an open uh, sub-manifold sub, sub of x squared. OK? So again, you can, it's easy to see that the uh, the zeroth jet of f is transverse to w if and only if its image does not intersect w. So uh, the set of injections it's now just going to be this set of smooth functions such that its zeroth two jet intersects W transversely. And by the Tom transversality theorem, so this is
Hello. I think I my internet dropped. Hello. Tá funcionando agora. Ah, eu acho que a minha internet caiu. Where did you stop hearing me? Can you show this next? Yeah, I'm showing. Oh no, I'm I'm not showing. I'm gonna get better internet. Dá para editar o vídeo quando for postar no YouTube. Yeah, dá para cortar dentro do próprio aplicativo do YouTube. Você não precisa baixar um aplicativo novo. Não. Ah, dá mesmo? Dá, dá, ah, dá, dá sim. Ah, ah, legal. Mas é só saber. corte. Só corte, tá. Tudo bem. Um, ok, so, um, I think you saw I'm up to here, right? We didn't hear the corollary. Para mim travou antes do final da prova da transversalidade. Bem ah, finalzinho. travou antes do final da prova. É, bem no finalzinho. Ok, so, so let me say it again. So uh, let me go back here. So the condition that we had is that the uh, the zeros jet of F in order 2 is transverse to W if and only if the image of this jet does not intersect W. So then that means that being an injective function from x to y, we can write that as a set of functions satisfying some transversality condition. And by the transversality theorem for multi-jets, this set is residual. Okay. Therefore, um, we have the theorem that uh, the intersection of, injective, uh, of the injective maps with the immer immersion, immersions is residual. Okay. And, a corollary of that is that if you take a compact set, then the set of embeddings is also residual. And the set of embeddings is, if, if X is compact, then an injective immersion is an embedding. Okay? But if X is not compact, then uh, you would need to assume a little more for the set of embeddings uh, to, to even find that there exists something in the set of embeddings. Okay, so what we're going to see now is we're going to restrict to the case where r equals, where, where y is r to n. So now we fix y to be equal to r, sorry, rm. And what we're going to do is we're going to consider the intersection of this inject, we're going to consider the injective immersions that are also proper. And we'll show that, that there exists at least something there. So the goal is to prove the uh, Whitney embedding theorem. Which is that the set of embeddings, this is sort of the, the easier version or maybe the mild version, uh, is non-empty. Okay. So um, how do we how do we do that? Well, we are going to look at the set of proper maps. So the problem is that you know the, the, being an embedding is a bit of a harder uh, it's a harder concept to write in terms of transversality theorem uh, because it requires you to look at the topology of the ambient space. Uh, so I, I don't know if there's a way. I, I don't think there is such an easy way if the domain is not compact to talk about uh, an embedding in just in terms of some transversality conditions. Um, yeah, in this case, it's even easier because well, the transversality conditions that you want is to not is to, to intersect is to not intersect a certain submanifold. So both for injected injections and for immersions. The transversality condition is really something about not intersecting some submanifold. And I don't think that there's a similar way to talk about embeddings of a non compact manifold. Um, so we have to be a little bit clever, at least to show that this uh, is different from the empty set. 
right, to show that there exists an embedding. So the lemma is, well, and recall that if you have an injective immersion that's also proper, then it's going to be an embedding. So the lemma is basically to show that this intersection here will uh, intersect the set of proper maps. So let's look at the set of proper maps. So let x be a manifold. Uh, then this set of proper maps, so this is the set of functions, uh, smooth functions from x to rm, such that f is proper, is open and non-empty. OK, so let's prove this. The proof is actually kind of straightforward. But so first recall that there exists a proper map uh, from, from x to r. OK, so we can always find a proper map of a manifold into R. And the way that we do that is, if, is by exhausting x with an increasing sequence of compact sets. So I explained that a few classes ago, uh, how you can find k1, k2, k3, etc. So you can write x as an increasing union of a uh, countable number of compact sets. So kn contained in kn plus 1. Uh, well, to be, we can actually make sure Kn is contained in the interior of Kn plus 1, and Kn is compact. And if you do that, then you can define a function. Uh, we can find a let psi be a smooth function such that psi is equal uh, is identically equal to n in i don't know k 2n minus k 2n minus 1 something like that so you kind of fix it to be uh, 1 and then you skip 1 and you fix it to be identically equal to 2 so you have some wiggle room to go between one and the other um, and such that, actually, this is enough. And it's not very hard to see that this guy is proper. Okay. Remember, proper just means that the pre-image of a compact set is compact. OK. So uh, now if you compose it, if you compose, compose in psi with an injection, a linear injection uh, with the map with the linear injection that takes r to r times r m minus one, we obtain a proper map from x to r m for any m that you want. Okay, so this shows that it's non-empty. Um, to show that it's open, uh, let now let f be a proper map. Um, let, we're going to show that there is a neighborhood of f that's still in uh, the set of proper maps. So we're going to let vx be the set of y's in Rm, such that the distance between y and f of x, uh, well, I can write it with norms to be a little less big. So some kind of norm, y minus f of x is less than 1. Maybe um, you could norm if you want. Excuse me. I don't yes. see why you compose with pc. We get uh, 
problem there. Um, if you compose with a linear injection, so if you take a compact set here, uh, the pre-image of this, so either this, either this guy intersects, uh, projects to R or not. Uh, so if it projects to R, the projection has to be compact. And the pre-image of this map is going to be just the projection to R of your compact set. So if you take a compact set in RM, the pre-image of it by this linear injection is compact. Right? Right. And then the pre-image by Psi is going to be compact because Psi is proper. Okay. okay. Uh, are you, is, that, uh, is it not clear? Yeah, I can say it again. Okay, it's clear because I draw a picture here and I thought it would be... So, okay, so let, let me draw the picture. Yeah, let me draw the yeah, picture. No, this help is, me. It's let just, you know, f f the first thing you need, you need to see is that this map here, this linear injection, is a proper map. So, uh, actually, it's not the projection. It's just the intersection with, the, with this guy. So, uh, because this is an injection, if you, if you take a compact set here, say, uh, you just have to intersect it with the image of this map. And the intersection of the image of this map is going to be uh, compact. So in this case, you know, if this is your R and this is the other R, here the intersection is empty. But if you uh, put the K, I don't know. Oops, sorry. Okay, okay, I see it now. I mean, it's... I saw it. Okay, so if, if your K, I don't know, intersects R, it's not the projection, it's even simpler. Right. If, if you uh, intersect K with the x-axis here, then you get a compact set in R2. Yeah, no. I, did, I, I draw a, a wrong picture, like a projection, so... Okay. All right. Uh, let's try to erase this. Um, all right, so now given a function f, let me call this vx. Um, so clearly vx, vx is open. That's because f is continuous. Uh, no, this is just the ball centered around x, y, uh, f of x. This is, this is not even because f is continuous. But because f is continuous, we actually can look at the... the union of x times vx, this is an open set of x times y. So this is open because now you have to use the fact that f is continuous because f is continuous. So this is the op an open set of the zero, zeroth jet space. Um, and clearly, F belongs to M of V. Okay, so the jet, the zeroth jet of F um, is in V, obviously, because you get zero here. Because X, F of X belongs to V. Um, this is the zeroth jet of f at x. Okay? Now, uh, if g also belongs to m of v, uh, then the distance between the image uh, of g and the image of f is less than 1. Uh, so, when you look at the pre-image of the ball of radius r at zero, uh, the closure of that 
that's going to be contained, the closed ball, in the ball, in the pre-image of the ball of radius r plus 1. So the radius goes up to by 1 at least. Um, and this uh, guy is compact because f is proper. So that means that the pre-image of the closed ball is also compact. So this guy here is also compact. Because it's a closed set contained in a compact set. And that's enough to prove that it's proper. Uh, you just need um, the pre-image of balls, of, of closed balls, to be, to be compact. Therefore, G is proper. So that means that M of V, which is an open set in the C0 and hence the C infinity topology, is contained in this set of proper maps. And F is in there. OK. So the corollary. is the Whitney embedding theorem. Which says that, well, let x be a manifold, then x embeds into r to n plus 1, if the dimension is n. And the proof now is, well, we already saw that the set of injections the immersive injections or injective immersions is residual uh, and hence dense. So if you intersect that a dense set with an open and non-empty set, then you have some you get something that's non-empty. So the intersection, sorry, this is R two N. Oh, uh, are 2n plus 1, are 2n plus 1. So that means that the, the, there exists something in the intersection of the set of injectives, in, injections, immersions, and proper maps. This is different from the empty set. And some, and uh, if F is a proper injective immersion, we already saw this uh, at the very beginning of the course, then F is an embedding. Okay. So any questions about this? Uh, the previous lemmas, can we do this with I? Any Riemannian uh, manifolds? Because uh, you kind of use a Zaxion by a compact and the metric to, to define the ball or to argue one. Yeah, that, that's a good, uh, an interesting question. I haven't thought about that. Um, if you can replace. Uh, yeah, here you really have uh, the w y is always in this proposition rm. I don't know if you can do it in general. Um, yeah, like in, in, to, to be able to prove that you can always embed uh, x into y if the dimension of y is bigger than or equal to 2n plus 1. I, I haven't thought about this. If I, the dimension of y is 2n plus 1, then any you can find open subsets of it that are diffeomorphic to R n R two n plus one. So you can bat into that. Wouldn't that work? Oh. Can be right. Yeah, I think sorry, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah you can you can right. do that. You can just take an open neighborhood of Y. Just take a neighborhood of a point and that's diffeomorphic to R uh, to the M where where, the, where m is a dimension of the manifold, then you can embed. That's that's true. 
Uh, but you know, yeah, you get something very small in a way, you know, very local. Um, yeah, that's true. Who who was that? Miguel. Yeah. So that's that's a good point. Yeah, let me just write that down. So if Y is a manifold of dimension two n plus one, then uh, you can take, then you can embed r two n plus one inside of y by just looking at a neighborhood of a point. Uh, neighborhood of a point is diffeomorphic to r two n plus one, so you can embed x n into y two n plus one. Okay, that's true. Okay. Um, now I want to just talk about one more consequence of this uh, this theorem, which is uh, about the existence of Morse functions. So I, I'll talk about this kind of quickly, but we're going to talk about Morse theory. Uh, not it's not the next topic, but I, I since we're talking about jets, I just wanted to tell you about the existence and abundance of Morse functions. So let me just uh, do a quick definition. So if we have a smooth function from x to r, and you have a critical point. So a critical point of a function from x to r just means uh, a point where the derivative is 0, because that's what you need for the, for the uh, derivative not to be surjective. That's exactly the same thing. Um, we can define the Hessian. Uh, the Hessian of f at p is the bilinear um, map defined by, oh, it's going to be a map d to f from tpx times tp x to r. Um, and I'm going to define it on a basis. So if you take d dx1, d dx i at p, d dx j at p, this is just uh, d2 f composed with phi inverse, dx i dx j at phi of p where phi is a chart. No, 2rn is a chart. So it's just the second derivative. Um, the, the, the second derivative matrix gives rise to a bilinear map. And um, the exercise is that this uh, is in, it's indeed a bilinear map on the tangent spaces, so that this map, this thing does not depend on the choice of chart, provided that we actually are at a critical point, so that provided that the FP is equal to zero. But this is just a chain rule they have to um, to do here, and you have to use the fact that you're at a critical point. So this Hessian is well defined at a critical point. And now we say that uh, P, a critical point of F, is non-degenerate if this map here, uh, this Hessian, is non-degenerate as a bilinear form, as a bilinear map. Okay. That's the same thing as saying that this matrix D2F um, DXI DXJ is invertible. Okay. Well, the reason we you know define this bilinear map and not the matrix is that the, the matrix itself is not it's, it's not going to give rise to a well-defined map from tpx to tpx. This will depend on the chart. 
But the fact that it's invertible does not depend on the chart. What it means uh, for a critical point to be non-degenerate. And I guess the proposition that you know is kind of relevant for us is that uh, a critical point is non-degenerate if and only if the first jet of F is transverse to S1 at P. So remember, S1 is uh, the um, is the set of one jets whose co-rank is one. And the point you know that you should notice is that S1 is just a complement of S0 because the maximum rank is one because we're taking functions from R from X to R. So wait, what's the proof of this? Uh, the proof is relatively simple if you look at, uh, at it the right way. So first of all, this is a local question. So we might as well just assume that x is equal to some subset of Rn. So the jet one space of u r is u times r times the linear maps from Rn to r. Okay, well, this is isomorphic. And the point is that you can find, uh, you can just project onto this part here, like forget about U and R. This is a submersion, it's a projection. I mean, well, yeah, it's, it's a projection, so it's a submersion. And it's not hard to see that the pre-image of zero is just S1. So it's a set of functions, of um, j one jets of functions, such that the, this part here, which is a derivative, is zero. Okay? And then now we apply you know, some, um, some results, some lemma that we, we proved last week, which is that uh, J1 of F is going to be transverse to S1 at P if and only if uh, when I when I compose this one jet with a with a submersion uh, if this is a submersion at P okay this is uh, some lemma from last week This is kind of straightforward from the definition of transversality. You just write it down. Um, okay, so now you can write what this map is. So what is the projection of the first jet onto this guy? That's just a derivative. Uh, the, 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 if you want the gradient or the differential of the function. So this map here uh, goes from u to l of our nr it just takes a point x to df dx1 of x df dxn of x to be honest this is like a, not a vector but a matrix like this and so th these two are are two manifolds uh, of the same dimension i mean there, there are two euclidean spaces so this is a submersion is a submersion at P if and only if the derivative at P of this map is uh, invertible. So if and only if d2f dxi dxj at P is an invertible matrix. So this is if and only if uh, P is non-degenerate. Okay, because I'm assuming, sort of, you know, because I'm assuming that uh, J1F of P belongs to S1. So I'm assuming that I actually have a critical point. Otherwise, the condition, the, yeah, you can't even talk about non-degenerate critical points. Okay, so to finish, uh, let me just 
make the definition. So you say that a function f is Morse if every critical point is non-degenerate. And now the theorem, which is basically just a corollary of uh, the Tom Transorcelli theorem, um, is that the set of Morse functions is open and dense. So let X be a manifold, then the set of functions such that F is Morse is open and dense. Okay, well, the proof is completely straightforward uh, once you know the Tom transversality theorem because of because the condition of being Morse uh, basically note that F is Morse if and only if uh, the one jet space of F to, of X is intersects S1 transversely. Sorry, S, it's not S1, up it's S1. This is the circle, it's this S1 down. And S1 is a is an is a submanifold, but it's also an open uh, it is a closed submanifold of the one jet space because um, S1 is just the complement of S0 because there are no higher S SRs. So because it's a closed submanifold, then the set of functions that are transverse to S1, uh, whose first jet is transverse to S1, is also an open set. So it's residual and open. So by the Chalm transversality theorem, uh, we get the result. OK? All right, we'll stop here for now. Uh, in the next class, uh, we're going to talk about, start talking about intersection theory.